Deuteronomy, chapter 34, verses 1 to 12. Then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, which is opposite Jericho, and the Lord showed him the whole land, Gilead as far as Dan, all Naphtali, the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah, as far as the western sea, the Negev, and the plain, that is the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees, as far as Zor. The Lord said to him, This is the land of which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. Then Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab at the Lord's command. He was buried in a valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor, but no one knows his burial place to this day. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His sight was unimpaired and his vigor had not abated. The Israelites wept for Moses in the plains of Moab for 30 days. Then the period of mourning for Moses was ended. Joshua, son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him, and the Israelites obeyed him, doing as the Lord had commanded Moses. Never since has there arisen a prophet in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. Moses was unequaled for all the signs and wonders that the Lord sent him to perform in the land of Egypt, against Pharaoh and all his servants and his entire land, and for all the mighty deeds and all the terrifying displays of power that Moses performed in the sight of all Israel. The Israelites were at the Jordan River to cross into the Promised Land. That was good news to these Israelites who survived famine, slavery, homelessness, and a major identity crisis while wandering the desert. The Israelites would cross the Jordan River to return to a land their ancestors had called home hundreds of years earlier until famine sent them to Egypt for food. In the meantime, other people had been living in this promised land. They also called it home. The land was called Canaan. The people living in it were Canaanites. But the Israelites had been looking forward to the promise of the Jordan River for hundreds of years. In fact, the Jordan River is a character itself. In the Hebrew Bible, it's mentioned about 200 times. The river is the promise of life itself, and the Israelites are always talking about living on its banks and hearing God promise it to them. What's the Jordan River for us, for you and for me? What is our North Star, beloved community, kingdom of God? What are we orienting our lives around and longing for? And I don't just mean when my candidate gets elected. The Jordan River is centuries worth of expectation. The river is the border between foreign land and home. It's the boundary between the past and the future. It's a place of abundance and refuge. Crossing this river may have been so important that the Israelites wander the wilderness for 40 years just to prepare. See, there's a funny thing about the geography of this story why would the Israelites need to cross the Jordan? The direct way does not involve crossing the Jordan at all. Many biblical scholars draw their map this way and imagine that the years of wandering the wilderness were that oval-ish shape south of the Dead Sea and the Jordan River, such that they could end up east of the river and need to cross over it into Canaan. What's this about no GPS, poor planning, would Moses not ask for directions? I doubt it. I think like every other detail in the Bible, this was a deliberate detour. Whether we ascribe it to God or the people recording the story, these 40 years were someone's intent. They are a choice. Without these 40 years, the Israelites would never have crossed the Jordan. They still would have ended up on its banks, but the moment of crossing over would not have been necessary. And the story tells us clearly that crossing the Jordan was necessary for this tired, cranky group of travelers. The Israelites have to cross the river because they need a border between the old and the new. Moses, Miriam, and Aaron have led them out of Egypt and through the desert, but because they wander around, 
all three of these essential leaders die and are buried along the way. We don't have to wander 40 years in the wilderness to prepare for the next thing. We are waiting for vaccines. We're counting down the days till all the votes are counted. We're working toward a culture with less racism and homophobia. We are definitely wandering. We are certainly in wilderness. We are eager to cross over into the new world coming. Even when we feel lost, we have work to do, community to share, and more than manna to eat. God is at work in our bodies, setting us free from bondage, leading us to nourishment in the midst of famine, raising up new leaders, feeding us with thoughtful sharing and kindness as we gather our mind. Each time we get to hear each other's stories and pray for one another. This is plenty of good news, but there's more. Those of us who seek to follow Jesus turn to the Gospels to read about the revolution John the Baptist prepares in the same Jordan River. John's father, Zechariah the priest, has an honored place in mainstream Jewish society. John flees the city's security and seductions and lives as a hermit in the desert, eating locusts and honey, letting his hair dry. It doesn't seem like John would be particularly popular, but Jews yearning for spiritual meaning flock to him, and he begins baptizing people to symbolize repentance and forgiveness. Who could John the Baptist be today? I think of Nadia Bowles-Weber, a tattooed recovering addict who planted a famous church in Denver. Nadia prepares the way for Jesus with memorable style. Who else comes to your mind? Who is transforming tradition for today? Not calling people to the temple, but to the river for ancient ritual revolutionized. That's the power of the Jordan River or any other border we create. When we enter the boundary waters, we mark a new reality, like turning the calendar to 2021, when we will mark a new year, praying to live anew, to see the world renew. Jesus is a new kind of leader. He doesn't ascend the mountain to speak to God in secret like Moses. Jesus wades down into the water to be with John and the yearning Jews, joining them in a ritual of repentance and forgiveness. Thank God Moses and Miriam and Aaron lead the Israelites out of slavery. But there's a reason they can't cross the Jordan into the promised land. It's time for a new way. Joshua and judges like Deborah lead the people next. 1,500 years later, Jesus and John enter the Jordan to make another new way. And 2,000 years later, we need to make new ways. We are still crossing borders. We are still learning how to get close to God by ascending mountains, by descending into rivers, by joining one another in soggy repentance and forgiveness, by looking around to gather up God's messages of love and blessing. Just as God creates and recreates over and over within and among us, we are called to be agile, to be open in the ways that we organize. Remember in the Exodus story when the Israelites would get tired of all that walking and waiting and say, can't we just go back to Egypt? At least we had work to do and food to eat. It's natural to long for the familiarity of the past. Whether it's pining for the good old days when we could eat inside restaurants or something more serious like when politicians and journalists had integrity. I don't think the good old days were ever as good as we believe. Our memories tidy things up and leave out nuance. Really, did we ever have enough time? Did we ever trust our leaders? Our faith calls us away from rose-colored glasses turned to the past. We are called to step forward into the unknown. And the Jordan River reminds us that, like Heraclitus said 2,500 years ago, we can't step in the same river twice. It was true when he said it, and it will be true long after we're all gone. How do you think Moses felt when God pointed him toward that river and said, you're not coming? Satisfied? by leading the exodus out of Egypt, by leading the Israelites around the wilderness? Or did he ache 
to cross over with them. I've been thinking about my friend Carol Hunter, a history and peace studies professor who was dying of cancer in the fall of 2016, and one consolation was that she would see the first woman elected president of the United States. She'd been teaching about social movements and nonviolent struggle for decades, and she would die having witnessed a historical moment. And instead, she died disturbed, despairing about the state of this country. She also died surrounded by loved ones and at peace with her family. But related to the election, she died in despair. And of course, Carol is on my mind and heart this fall. I think of Carol and Martin Luther King and Moses and all the leaders who leave us before we get to the promised land. A long life, longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over. And I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you. But I want you to know the night that we as a people will get to the promised land. So I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. My eyes have seen the glory. In all the endings and beginnings, in all the waitings and in the midst and in-betweens, God be with you.